Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the first workshop, uh, Tuesday's workshop. And I can see that uh, Bjarke is the co-host of the session and he is still letting a number of people in. So I would like to welcome all of you. We have, um, at the moment we have 24 of us participating in the workshop. So I'd like to welcome everybody and uh, it's really great to have you joining us from the other side of the world. Bjarke and I are still in Cape Town. And um, what I'd like to do is, while uh, the rest of the, of the colleagues join, let me quickly share my screen and I'm going to take you through the agenda um, that we are going to be covering tonight. What I'm doing is that I am, I am recording the session. Uh, the recording was really, really bad for last week's session. So um, uh, it was, there were huge chunks missing. So that is why I didn't share it. Um, I'm really hoping that this week uh, that the, the recording is a lot better. Um, the way we're going to be running it this evening is that I'm going to take you through a short introduction. Um, Bjarke is uh, managing the, the lobby and uh, making sure that everybody can get into the session. Please use the, uh, the chat option to ask questions. And um, unless you specifically want it to be a private uh, chat, then please uh, actually share it with all of the participants so that everybody can see the question. Um, let me take you through the agenda quickly. Um, so yeah, this is the, the first workshop. We're going to go through some examples of various CubeSat missions, followed by the sustainable development goals, so that we can have a look at those goals and see how we can actually get inspired um, by the, the sustainable development goals so that we can um, design payloads for our CubeSats. We're then going to move on to taking a fourth industrial revolution approach uh, because the thing is that what we're looking at is we're looking at the, the future oh, world. Uh, sorry, uh, Siri has uh, decided to get involved in the conversation. That's fourth industrial revolution for you. Uh, Siri is one of our leading revolutionaries when it comes to um, the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how can we actually apply those techniques from fourth industrial revolution to our CubeSat missions. Um, and then I've got two examples that we want to take you through. And at this point, I'm actually going to hand over to Bjarke because he's going to take you through uh, the details of, of those examples and how a traditional uh, CubeSat payload, uh, what we've done is we've taken the fourth industrial revolution uh, ideas and applied that and then come up with some really interesting examples. Um, then we're going to have very much a discussion um, and this is where we would really like contributions from everybody because here we would like to discuss the um, the fundamentals uh, of cubesats uh, what sensors there are available what uh, ideas um, team members have come up with in terms of what they could be sensing what are the different power solutions that are available and what do we need to consider taking into, you know, take into consideration regarding um, the power um, design for our CubeSat, and the different um, CPUs that we can use, different single board computers, and very importantly, communication. Once our CubeSat is launched, we don't have any option of retrieving it. And so we're going to be relying solely on our communication with our um, between our satellite and and our ground station, and then we're going to go through how can we have recommendations for further topics. Um, we don't want to uh, we don't want to run the agenda. We would like you to um, design the agenda, and we will make sure that what we do is if we can't put together a session ourselves, we will find somebody who will be able to present a session. Um, Bianca, I can see that you've turned your camera on. Um, would you like to give yeah, me I'm to say anything? No, sorry, it's, really, it's just that I can't see uh, if you're sharing. I think you're sharing, but I can't see anything. So I'm not sure um, if you are sharing. 
Okay. Uh, let me, let me try again and then hopefully you can give me a, a thumbs up. Um, how is that? Is that working now? I'm still only seeing you. Okay. Um, maybe if uh, some of the participants can unmute and... Yeah, if your screen is being shown, about, uh, I can see it screen so okay you can so you can see a photograph okay. of a of a yeah, cute four of them yeah okay i can cool. see your screen also okay <laughs> fabulous just me thank uh, you that's great uh Bjork, it's not personal <laughs> great wonderful excellent well then let's uh let's let's uh let's start great so yes um what are what are the what are the typical solutions that are used for for CubeSats? Um, a very very good use of CubeSats is for testing of new sensors, uh, new materials, see how they perform in space, as well as various power solutions. Um, CubeSats were originally designed by Professor Bob Twiggs and Jordi Proxari um, for for students to give students access to space. Um, and uh, it was then seen as a very, very useful format by NASA Ames in the USA to actually use it to, to test um, different types of hardware and materials, et cetera, different combinations um, in a very uh, rapid turnaround way and a very relatively inexpensive way. So that was how CubeSats really actually came into their own um, as, as a format. Uh, that could be launched into orbit. Um, also, of course, gathering data like ultraviolet, infrared, magnetism, or radiation. So really actually deploying sensors, uh, gathering that data, and then communicating that with, with the ground station. And Earth observation and imaging for disaster management, illegal sailing, and uh, terrestrial change. Um, Bjarke can... Can I ask you to maybe just, um, I know that maybe you can't see the photograph, but you certainly know the application of when we have boats um, and they are off the coast. Uh, we can't see them yeah. over the there. Yeah, so so, uh, so the example you have up on the screen there is uh, off the coast from Ghana. So uh, one of the big problems is illegal fishing. And uh, the way that that is tracked is that you have a satellite flying overhead that is um, listening to radio communication. So it's actually just pick up, it doesn't listen to the radio communication, just pick up that there is uh, noise on certain frequencies. So it, look, uh, it listens to, uh, uh, if it's close to the coast, it listens to DSM, the DSM frequency, or it, looks, uh, it listens to a normal ship radio communication frequencies and those kind of frequency that you will expect people are using. And what they're doing is that they then at the same time try to see if that ship have a transponder signal. And if that ship is not sending a transponder signal, uh, they kind of like have given themselves away being there by having um, uh, the radio communication, but without a transponder signal, they're up to no good. Uh, whether that is illegal fishing, smuggling, uh, whatever it can be, uh, it's just simply getting flagged. And, and that position is then sent via the satellite uh, to the Coast Guard, who is then going out and figure out what's happening at, 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 the, at, at a certain spot. So, um, uh, and, and this is actually an application that uh, our local university in, uh, in Cape Town have, have um, put up. So, so they have like, a, I think it's a 2U satellite so a CubeSat that is 20 by 10 by 10 centimeter that actually listen to that uh, generic radio communication and the a transponder signal. And then it uh, um, extrapolates a position based on those um, information. So that's that example. Julie, you also have the example with the flooding? Yes, with, uh, with flooding. Yes, we have um, two different dates and we've got uh, different sets of imagery um, of yes. how, um, you know, in terms of flooding. So, so one of the interesting thing is that one of the 
probably most used uh, um, um, technologies and being used on satellite is simply just having a camera on it and taking pictures uh, of the ground. And obviously, a normal camera with a normal picture is maybe not useful all the time, but what can be used is like, for example, in this case here, where it takes a picture the one day and a picture the next day and so on. Um, or every time it flies over, which is approximately um, every 12 hours, then it will take a, a picture and it uh, will download it. Or if uh, you have AI on board the satellite, it will compare the two pictures and kind of like give a warning. And it can do that with a lot of things. In this case, it's flooding. It could do it with, for example, there's a forest fire. It can also have another type of lens, uh, kind of like the infrared or ultraviolet. It's a multi-spectrum camera. And with that, it can, for example, see if uh, vegetation is uh, is uh, okay or if it's dying off. So that's a way to kind of like start tracking drought. Um, we have another satellite that was launched um, for, for, for the purpose of, of capturing a forest fire. And one of the things that they figured out was that before a forest fire starts, uh, um, the forestry actually sends out a small amount of potassium. And, uh, and they had a, a, a multi-spectrum camera that uses spectroscopy to, to actually see the potassium and could actually then warn about uh, imminent forest fire that way. And back to this thing with the camera, the first satellite that actually sent off this university was just a normal one CubeSat. And I used it to, um, as, a, as, a, as a radar point. They were gonna try to uh, measure something where they simply just wanna have a ping back. And because it was such a simple thing, they decided to put another payload on, which was just a camera. And what they did was that they didn't have any um, um, attitude control, which means that they couldn't point to Earth. It was just kind of like flipping around in space. So what they would do is that they will kind of like just figure out on the picture it took, if it was black and it wasn't black, they will download it and it will see, oh, this is like a great picture. Or this is all a great picture. And I did that simply just kind of like very simple methodology to, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, have another uh, project on that satellite since uh, they couldn't send anything less than a CubeSat off. So that's just a couple of examples, 85% of all communication to satellites today, it's actually just some kind of imagery. It's a video or a picture, and it might be pointing at Earth, or it might be pointing out. But there's really a lot of the data that's been downloaded today that's based on, on imagery of some sort. Judy? Great, Bianca, thank you very much. So yeah, the sustainable development goals. Um, there's 17 goals, all in all. Um, and there is a lot of really great lesson material out there. There's a lot of uh, terrific content that has been published by the United Nations, as well as a, a number of uh, academic institutions. So what you can do is you can have a look at it and you can decide um, and you can have a, a discussion amongst yourselves in the classroom on, uh, you know, what are we going to focus on? Life on land. Um, a great, some great examples given by Bjarke of how can we observe the quality of life on land when it comes to, to floods, fires, uh, all of that. Um, life below water, certainly by um, uh, using uh, uh, spectroscopy, uh, Bjarke knows how to say the word better than I do, um, or a, a, a definitely imaging of particular wavelengths, one can see the temperature of the oceans. Um, and so one can see are, are there areas uh, where perhaps it's, it's, it's too warm or where we've got um, cold currents uh, flowing and all of that kind of thing. So certainly um, what I would do is that I would recommend that you have a look at the uh, UN's Sustainable Development Goals to generate some ideas of how you can design payloads for your CubeSats. The fourth industrial revolution, it's a term that's been coined uh, definitely in the last 10 years, um, actually by the World Economic Forum. And uh, what they did is that they said, let's say if we had um, three industrial revolutions, the first industrial revolution was about mechanization, steam power, the weaving loom, which really changed um, 
a lot of the textile industry. And then industry 2.0 was about mass production, the assembly line, um, electrical energy. So that would have been what roughly, you know, just over a hundred years ago, um, Henry Ford uh, inventing the uh, the production line, uh, the, the assembly line, um, and of course electrical energy. Um, are the great uh, stories uh, that come to us from history of Nikola Tesla um, and Thomas Edison and uh, how they had these two different viewpoints, one with direct currents, the other one with alternating currents, um, and uh, who was actually going to win that uh, electrical battle uh, to become the standard. And as we know, uh, most of uh, electricity that we use nowadays is, is alternating currents. Um, industry 3.0, automation, computers, and electronics. And now with Industry 4.0, it's about cyber physical systems, internet of things and networks. So what is it really that we need to look at um, in terms of the specialities that we, um, we need to consider for the future? Certainly internet of things. So the idea that we have uh, a multitude of sensors in an environment uh, performing remote sensing for us and that the data from those sensors is transferred using the internet to a database where we can actually then start working with that data. We can infer from that data and it creates a platform for decision making for us. Um, and here we're not talking about five or 10 sensor, sensors. Here we're talking about thousands, sometimes even millions of sensors. So when, um, when any um, country uh, starts uh, looking at the smart city concepts. Here they're really looking at leveraging um, uh, Internet of Things with, across the city um, and how can there be millions of sensors out there collecting data on an on ongoing basis so that real-time decisions can be made about the operation, the safety, security of the city. Um, big data. Uh, this is one of the topics that Bjarke covers when we go through uh, the mission that we had to the International Space Station early this year. And uh, what it is, is it's about how there are particular techniques that one needs to start applying when dealing with really large uh, data sets, which, uh, and these, uh, these data sets can't be, can't be managed in something like a, an Excel or a Google Sheet. Um, here we really need uh, special database tools to, to start managing these very large sets of data. Uh, in machine learning, uh, what one does is one, uh, one uses the big data to train machines. Uh, we certainly can train machines through, through repetition. Uh, we can teach them. Um, and uh, then what we can do as well is we can start building artificial intelligence engines um, uh, based on all of those above, based on Internet of Things, all the, the sensing that, that we have, um, big data concepts, machine learning, and eventually what we can have is we can start having a level of uh, artificial intelligence. And robotics also fits into Industry 4.0, um, because here it's a combination of everything. The robot has its own sensors. Uh, we design artificial intelligence for that robot so that it can perform certain actions. And in a, most of those circumstances, the, the robot can learn um, because what it can do is it can go through processes of continuous improvement. It can learn by doing, by collecting more data and it can start converging on, on, on um, making, better, making better decisions. So, um, Bianca, what I'm going to do is here, I'm actually going to... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, and what it is is that we have two images. Um, one is image. Uh, I can see them now. You can see them now. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, Great. I figured out what was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Over to so, you. Yes, I can. Yes, good stuff. So this was uh, one of my ideas. So um, I think it has been done. I'm not hundred percent sure, but. One of the problems when you want to navigate in space in the, in the, in the economy of, 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 of a school or university is that uh, you can't use a GPS, a normal GPS in space. And uh, there's a reason for that. 
and that is that um, uh, various governments are nervous that uh, that GPS is being used to guide a missile. So uh, GPS have something that's called a COCOM limitation, C-O-C-O-M, a COCOM limitation. Hang on a second. <coughs> and that, that limitation limits a, a, a GPS to work if it's the speed of the satellite is higher than uh, a thousand miles an hour, or if the altitude is over 18, 18 kilometers. Yes. Now it have to be all, or uh, it have to be both of them. They have to be uh, broken in order for that uh, not to work. But the different uh, GPS providers they interpret this uh, rule a little bit differently. And it's since been updated, so you can now fly up to 50 kilometers in altitude. So, for example, with our GPS, uh, we haven't necessarily got that high, but at, but uh, if you use it, for example, on a weather balloon that goes to 40 kilometers, or up to 40 kilometers, so 120,000 feet or something like that, then you need um, you don't need a, a, a space-rated uh, GPS because your balloon is not flying a thousand miles an hour. But once you get into low Earth orbit, so LEO, you fly a speed of uh, 27, 28,000 kilometers um, per hour, and you are obviously in altitudes of uh, like 400 kilometers. And then the DPA, normal DPS will not work. So then you have to go out and get yourself a space rated DPS, and they are a little bit more difficult to get hold of. So one of the projects I imagined was that could you imagine you had a camera on your satellite that you know faced down to earth and here's like a picture of Italy because that's always my favorite example. And I can see that's Italy because I looked at the map before and that looks like Italy. I also know approximately how my satellite flies. It's not like suddenly, you know, over Greenland or Galapagos Islands, you know, it's going in specific routes. So, I constantly can imagine what is the next thing I have to see. So I also kind of like can control the, the satellite so it points down to Earth directly. So I should be able to take a picture uh, or, or, or take you know images from this satellite, not necessarily send them down to Earth or anything like that, but use some image recognition and say, this is my latitude and longitude. So I can use image recognition to navigate in. But the real idea here is that I can now have satellites flying over other bodily, uh, heavenly bodies like the moon that Judy have uh, presented here, like the Tycho crater. And uh, because the, the whole moon has been mapped, we could actually have a satellite that simply just looks at where it flies over the moon, and then it will be able to uh, um, uh, have you know, a, a, a satellite position without having GPS, which of course is not flying around the moon right now. And of course that technology can be used, uh, you know, if you send a satellite up around Mars. Now, so um, if most of us, if we ever get uh, the opportunity to launch a satellite, it will probably be around Earth. But for example, there's a university, Morehead State University in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, they have, uh, uh, have built a 6U satellite that's gonna look for ice it's called Lunar Ice Cube uh, because it's a CubeSat, it's a 6U, and that's going to look for, uh, for ice around the moon. So they are flying a satellite that way around. And that could be interesting if they not only look for ice, but also like at a, um, a, a, a navigation system based on image recognition. So that's another example of what, where you combine uh, images with onboard machine learning or AI in order to kind of like do the image recognition. What, yes, thank you, Bianca. What I'd like to do is that I'd just uh, like to show this example. So here we have uh, some uh, treetops. This is a shot taken by a drone um, over a forest. And um, the reason why I'm using this, this example is that uh, I was at a drone conference late last year where one of the speakers was talking about artificial intelligence uh, on drones for conservation. And um, what it is, is that they had, a, they had drones that were flying over very densely forested areas. And on one occasion, 
when the drone came back, it said, I detected an anomaly in this exact position, this GPS position. And uh, what they did is that they sent some rangers out uh, to have a look. And sure enough, there was a community of animal poachers. And what they were doing is that they were camping out in the forest. And one of them had erected a washing line. And what the drone saw is it just saw there's a line and we don't get straight lines in nature. So here's an anomaly. I don't know what it is, but I know that there's something that's wrong. So what we could do is we could use that same type of artificial intelligence on our satellites where they could be in orbit and it's only when they recognize an anomaly that they can say, I'm, this is the picture I'm going to send down or this is the GPS location that I'm going to send down. So what we've done now is we've taken fourth industrial revolution concepts, artificial intelligence, um, and we've applied that in a CubeSat environment. So instead of having um, masses of photographs which need to be downloaded or video footage that needs to be downloaded, which is really, really expensive because that's one thing you're going to find with your CubeSat budget is you're going to have a data budget. Um, so what you actually want to do is that you want to run your AI engine on your CubeSat and what you want to do is you only want it to tell you when there's an anomaly. And the thing is, it doesn't even have to send the photograph. What it can do is it can say, hang on, I've detected a straight line at this exact GPS position. Or I'm seeing here that something has changed. Um, I orbited here uh, you know, so many hours ago. And since then, uh, the, 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 the route of the, the river has changed slightly, or maybe the banks are swollen, uh, I'm detecting a little bit more smoke, uh, I've got a change in temperature. Any kind of anomaly can be detected and then only the data of the GPS position sent, which really saves considerably um, on, our, um, on our data budget. So the thing is that in, in the next session where we have our open and our group discussion, um, what, what I'd like us to consider is that with absolutely everything, we have a budget. So we have a power budget, we have a financial budget, we have a data budget, um, a mass budget, because uh, your, your CubeSat is only allowed to weigh so much, so many grams, otherwise you're not allowed to launch it. We have a size, a volume budget. Uh, it needs to be within that 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters constraints. So there are all these various budgets that need to be taken into consideration. And then what we need to do is we need to weigh some up against others because we, we can't have everything. Um, what we need to do is we need to, um, we need to make some, some choices. And sometimes those are really, really tough choices. So at this point, what I'd Julie, like hang to on, do, before you yeah, okay. before you move on, um, I just go back to that slide. Robert Lee has a, has his hands up, so maybe we um, can get a question in here. Great. Um, hello, can I am I able to speak now? Yes, absolutely, yes, Robert. Speak. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a question back um, regarding a GPS. Is that is um, when you say that you were mentioning earlier that the reason why a GPS will not work at a certain altitude or a certain speed is because concerns of missiles or something like that? Yes, that's did correct. I hear that correct? Okay, you heard that correct. So, so, um, so, so it's it's kind of like you know uh, rules. Let me just put it like that. You can. You know, always um, uh, argue whether it's uh, it's uh, fair or not fair. But, uh, COCOM uh, was what ITAR was called in the old days. So the fact that it's called COCOM is still like, um, it just tells about how old this is. And of course, uh, originally GPS and still today, GPS is American system. But, you know, the uh, the Russian have the GLONASS system, the Chinese have the Baidu and the, and the Europeans basically with the Galileo. So there's a lot of other uh, systems like that, so you could probably find yourself a GPS that that, that worked on on one of those. But but still today, 
there is this Qualcomm limitation, and and it's actually just a it's just a a, a, a software block. There's no like technical question. So so typically, if you get like a GPS, let's say from Ublox or some of these guys that do a lot in that, uh, if if you have to get the you you pay a certain sum and it have to go through you know um, probably some um, uh, some approval process and then you get like a you know a patch to open that stuff app block it's in the code so it I see stop. okay it actually, it actually powers off if you are passing those limits uh, and then it doesn't turn on on again unless you like reboot it so 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 the thing is that it it's actually <clears throat> in the old days, um, when I'm saying the old days, before 1999, GPS had something that called SA, uh, selective accuracy, where because it was actually for military use, it will not give you a position uh, more um, uh, exact than 100 meters. And that was uh, turned on and off during uh, um, uh, the last century. So, for example, the, 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 the war in, in, uh, in uh, Kuwait, uh, they had to turn it uh, off because it uh, could only use a normal commercial uh, TPS that were not enough in the military otherwise. And then it was uh, back, uh, you know, with this uh, inaccuracy that was in, into effect. And then in 1999, they decided, you now the world has figured out how to get around that anyhow with something called differential GPS. So, um, so they decided, you know, we can now have full accuracy. So the GPS now is full accurate, but you can still not use it on something that flies faster than a thousand miles an hour and higher in altitude than in in the most cases 50 kilometers so so that's the reason for for for, for that limitation robert okay so i was wondering if it was like more of a gps specification limit or if it was something that was fundamentally built into every single gps chip or device in existence so, so as as far as I know, it's uh, so the, the way you know with GPS works is that it's it's a little uh, it's a it's a kind of like a firmware that runs inside the the GPS. Yes, and, there's like uh, a and, yeah, mm -hmm. and there's uh, and what it does is that it listens to different signal and infer like in uh, you know a, a position, and and the the software uh, there's actually if you Google this thing here, you can actually build your own GPS using a SPM32 chip and so you can yes. listen to the specific uh, radio signal and you can then and there's actually some software you can download and there's actually also um, somebody who downloaded and pointed out exactly where uh, that software uh, is doing that blockage so you can take that away and then you can actually build your own set uh, your own GPS that way it's of course a little bit bigger than uh, the one you normally buy because uh, you're going to lay that out on a PCB that's probably like you know, um, three, four inches across both ways uh, for, 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 for the different things. But, but uh -huh. there is actually a software out there where they show how to, uh, to do the GPS. And of course, you can also, um, you know, test if it works uh, because you can put in a Faraday case and then you can use a, a radio to spoof the GPS signal. But, but you have to make sure you do that uh, the right way. So like in a Faraday case where it's, it's, it's yes. the signal doesn't uh, go away, and then you can, you know, accelerate, uh, um, you know, the GPS uh, speeds uh, that way when you send the signal, and then you can figure out if the GPS works or not. And of course, you can do that for the commercial uh, GPS is before you spend the money and send it to space to figure out if they are, if, if they are like, um, um, what kind of limitation they have. But it is uh, typically not a hardware block. It, uh, it's a firmware block uh, that have to have a patch. It might even be that you give it a specific key or something like that, and then it opens up for for that. So, so it's um, all satellites should be able to work equally well. I mean, obviously there's a limitation because uh, the GPS, uh, you know, uh, uh, radios are facing Earth, so you have to be below those in altitude, and they're like in 1,400 kilometers. So if you fly Leo in 400, it's fine. But, you know, you okay. go to the geostation, uh, you have, like, a problem because they're, they're turning the wrong way around. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the story on the GPS. Um, yes, and the thing is that you, you certainly can purchase a GPS um, that you could fly on your satellite. Um, and what would need to happen is that then you would register it. Um, and then it would be associated with your satellite so that you, you would basically you would get a license for it. 
um, and that that can be costly. Um, you know, we've uh, we've received figures, you know, sort of uh, in in the region of uh, you know multiple thousands of dollars um, for a GPS. So so that is why we're looking at you know could we have some alternatives um, that we could consider. Uh, especially um, in Earth orbit, but you know, also the thing is with with lunar orbit and with Mars orbit, we don't have GPS satellites there, um, so uh, we would have to find another way uh, of of navigation. But um, I, I hope that answered the question. Uh, if you like, uh, what I if you if you want to put your your email uh, address in in the chat, um, I know that Bianca did draw up a document at one stage for, um, mm -hmm. for one of the uh, local USA uh, space agencies uh, at a stake level. And so maybe he can, what he can do is he can share a lot of that detail with you just to, just to really unpack it so that you know, you know at what point you would need to, to register uh, your GPS or when you don't need to. Okay. Um, I'll just put my um, email in the chat. Um, right. I'd love to talk to you um, after this. Okay. You know, this is a great presentation, but please continue. I think I'm holding okay. everybody back. No, no, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, that's absolutely fine. It's at this point, actually, where we're going to start discussing all of the fundamentals. So, um, yeah, the, the question actually came at the right time because this is, this is where we would like to get questions from everybody. Um, and let's actually start having a look at all of those various budgets that we, we need to take, take into consideration. So at this point, I'm actually going to stop sharing uh, and um, uh, we, we're going to open it up to the floor. So Judy, maybe while people are considering what they want to ask, um, let me just um, elaborate a little bit on the AI machine learning. Um, so when you had that... Um, uh, the picture of the tree tops um, and a, and a straight line. So, so the thing is, uh, in in general, uh, when you want to do your project here, you can of course consider many different things. So, so typical, if you want to put it on a satellite flying space, it's because you want to observe something, you want to test something, and 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 there's a lot of different things. As I think Judy mentioned earlier, you can use it to you know, observe something on the earth or, or, or other, way, other way around, you know, somewhere in space. You can use it to, uh, to as a tech demonstrator to, to test new material or new technologies and new rated technologies and new power solutions or whatever it is. So, so there's many different solutions. And, and the reason I just wanna, when we go and talk about sensors and things like that, the, the important to just to understand that what, what is uh, X in a box and what is X in a box not. So uh, we've done this uh, kit XK90, which is a, uh, a kit that we've been using for quite a long time. So within the space, which is the state level space uh, authority. So for those who don't know, it's, uh, many of the different states, actually, I think all states have their own space agency, similar to NASA. It's on federal level, Virginia have one on, on, their, uh, on, on state level. And Virginia is one of the four places in the US where, uh, well, um, more is coming, but where you traditionally have been launching rockets from. So, one of the islands uh, in Virginia is launching the Antares rocket. That is the one of the two supply ships to the International Space Station from U.S. soil. So they have a they had a, a, a space program that we delivered X chips to. That started back in 2017, and uh, and they sent up like small satellites that called SimSats, and that uh, that fly all flew uh, out our X chips, uh, at least 40 of them flew our X chips uh, back in 2019, which was the first mission. The next one is sometimes next year, obviously because of the pandemic here, things have been delayed a bit. So, so the thing is that uh, uh, our uh, technology is X chips where we collect uh, some data, but we are not collecting the heavy data. So we're not doing anything in video or photography or anything like that. Especially because there's so many solutions out there. Um, so, so ours is that we have like light sensors, we have uh, gas sensors, we have uh, uh, IMUs, accelerometer, magnometer, gyroscopes. Uh, we do have a GPS. Uh, we have a lot of these different sensors, and you can, uh, you know, you can use it for radiation sensing, like 
UVA and UVB and that kind of stuff. We have like an infrared temperature sensor. So, so a lot of these different sensors have been used. And, and the thing is that uh, when you do this thing here, either as a student or uh, as a school, um, consider that, uh, you know, uh, there's a couple of different ways of looking at when you build your satellite. Um, one of the ways is maybe replicate uh, a lot of projects simply just to get the learning, use it to figure out how to do that. Not all satellites have to be uh, groundbreaking and, you know, you find um, uh, the new formula for something. You know, it's it's you can actually replicate other projects that's been out there that you might find interesting. The learning process is the important part here, and and trying to do something that is uh, interesting and everybody can participate in is maybe more the goal. And that's the kind of like the stuff that was uh, behind uh, it's in a box when we started that. But we do also recognize there might be other stuff you want to do. So. For example, when we have like uh, in 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 the kit, you are uh, if you buy the XK90, the, the the CPU that sits on the satellite um, um, on on this on we call it the flight station uh, is this CS11. So this is uh, the same as an Arduino Zero, and it have like a SD card here on the back. And obviously, you know that's all great when you fly something. Um, uh, on a balloon or drone or just have it in a, a classroom because uh, there's a good chance you get it back. When you go into a uh, space, uh, well, you maybe have it on the SD card because you store that before you download it with your radio. So, but this is a, this is a very elementary little CPU. Uh, MCU is called microcontroller unit and it will allow you to, to, to program in Arduino. In this case, you can also program in Scikit. Circuit Python, so you can do Python, and you can also do make code and things like that. So there's there's a lot of different opportunities uh, when you want to program that. You have to have a little programming interface, so you can plug it into USB to your computer. But but that's um, uh, that's the one unit. The other unit is this uh, CW1, and that you uh, that comes with the programming unit, and that has like a Wi-Fi behind here. So this one here, you can program in Arduino also, and it allows you to to, to you know, make a program that uh, you uh, can send data live uh, uh, using Wi-Fi. So we have that in the ground station in this XK90 kit. Now, um, uh, in, in, in the XK90, the reason why we kind of like have certain chips there and X chips, we call them sensors and things like that, is because we've done some software upfront. So you can install that software and get it up and running and working, and you can then try it to uh, you know, a car, a balloon, or drone, or whatever you want to, and, and see how it works. But you are also uh, having an opportunity to program these different devices, the rest of stuff, doing that, so you can. Now, let's say, for example, you say, but uh, I want to do something that's a little bit more heavy than this thing here. So I want to use like something like a beagle bone. So you can see we have like an interface here. So if you, for example, have like some sensor, and I'm just putting like a black, a like blank um, um, a board in here, so I can uh, plug in like uh, a, a board like that. And you can also do that on a Raspberry Pi. So depending on uh, where you are in the world, the Raspberry Pi is a, a British product that's quite famous in the uh, most part of the world. The bigger brand black is the uh, kind of like more uh, uh, well known in university circles in in uh, for for, um, 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 for for satellite use. Uh, so, for example, this thing here is a you know fully fledged uh, Linux computer. It has a, a you know a HDMI port and uh, and port for for keyboards and mouse and things like that. So, so this will run uh, you know a, a, a piece of software uh, or a Linux style where you can program in all kind of things. And what you can do is that if you want to then add you know, really hardcore uh, capabilities. You can actually get these uh, movie video sticks here that allow you then to do AI. So this is, there's nothing other than, it's a little onboard computer here, but it's kind of like, a, um, you know, your own little supercomputer for artificial intelligence. So it's made by Intel. So, uh, so that allows you to plug in and then you can load TensorFlow, which is a Google, AI product, and then you can do image recognition and things like that. 
So I'm just mentioning it because you can see the only thing that it's in a box here is maybe this little sensor here. Now, what if you want to put that on a satellite? Well, you can actually get the Raspberry Pi as a Raspberry Pi at zero. So this is uh, this size here, and you can get back an interface to that from uh, from us. It's called a BIO3. So you can see it's just the uh, size of of, of two um, of two X chips in size, and that allows you to to actually put a Linux computer inside your um, your XK90. So you can see compared to um, the, the the chip I showed you here before. Let me just take it uh, uh, from the back here. In both cases, you can see it's just double the size as uh, as this one here. And uh, you can get like uh, this, this is a camera port. You can get a camera for this thing here if you want to. Here's the SD card. Uh, there's like power, but this one here will be powered via this port here also. So you don't have to have separate power. You don't have to use the USB here and the port for powering. And obviously, you're not gonna uh, you know carry a, a screen around when you fly on a satellite. So you can just have a camera here. And we had a project where we put the, this camera here, and then we controlled it using a server controller. So we have like a little server controller uh, X chip somewhere on my table here. Uh, no, it's not this one, but it looks like this kind of stuff here where you don't have a server controller. So you can put a little server in and then you could uh, pan the camera and, and control the camera. So when you look at your opportunity, the whole idea is that you can take X chip and you can also combine it with other stuff. Now, X chips as they are, is very neatly fit inside a cube set. They're easy to click together. You don't have to do anything else. But if you say, for example, I have like, let's say, for example, that you want to use like a, uh, a, you know, an ultrasonic sensor. Not that they're very useful in space, but you know, you might want to use it with this thing here. How do I connect that? Well, so we have this kind of like brick breadboard interface here, where you can take your different sensors or cores or whatever you have already. And, and, and connect it to that. And then you can use normal breadboarding to connect it to your, your circuit. And of course, now you're on your own uh, because you have to figure out if you have the right power and the right pins and all that kind of stuff. But, but there is opportunities to kind of like uh, breadboard it like that. Um, it of course gets incrementally more difficult. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we did the X chips because, um, and you want to connect to X chips, there's no like wiring or anything like that. On the X chips, there's no, there's, it doesn't say what's on the pin because you can only put the connectors in, uh, in one way. And then when you click it together, you know that it has the right power and signal and all that kind of stuff. Everything is actually in the programming, which is the big, uh, the big task uh, uh, for us is to kind of like make it a little bit easier um on 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 getting going with satellites we originally developed this thing here so high school learners in south africa could build a satellite using uh no lab uh, and now, of course now more than ever it's uh, increasingly important that you can build electronics without a laboratory because we have to work from home not necessarily from a school so this thing here the only thing it requires is these five uh, to put this thing here together. So no voltmeter, scope, solder phase, and all that kind of stuff. So, and the reason I'm just saying that, and then I want to end with that, is that if you, for example, say, listen, we want to build a satellite, and we want to have John here, he have to work with, uh, with one sensor, and we want to have, you know, somebody else in the school, let's say, Susan, working with another sensor, you maybe just get, like, two of the same cores. And then you distribute the sensors. So, you know, one can work with one sensor and a, and a programming unit, and one can work with another sensor and a programming unit. And then when you integrate it, when you put it together, you can, you know, have a, a, a duplicate set of sensors, and then your teacher or whoever you want to integrate can then put it together to, to one unit. That way, it allows you to, to work uh, without having a requirement of a lab or anything like that. And of course, the, the chips will last to uh, you know future attempts of, of of doing other stuff like that because uh, you're not like using them. It's only once you send something into space, but then um, the price of the chips is not what's gonna uh, hold you back. It's a uh, it's a launch uh, of the satellite that's gonna be the 
expensive part. And Judy, I think that's, uh, I just want to add those comments and then see if you have some um, questions from the floor. Um, um, you're welcome. Bianca, it, it yeah, seems to me as if the only person who's interrupting you is me. Um, but there, there is, there's definitely something, there, there's two topics that I would like you to cover, um, yes. that we need to, that we need to consider when we're doing our CubeSat design. Um, one of them is around power and power budget and how, you know, how, how do we deal with that? How we do, how do we deal with, um, uh, consumption, power consumption, recharging, uh, what happens you know temperature wise that sort of thing and then um the other question that i also have for you is you know uh what about communication um you know what about uh, uh do, do, what which different choices do we make when it comes to communication whether we have a polar orbits whether we have a sun seeking uh sun synchronous orbits whether we have an iss a type orbit um and also, of course, our altitude, you know, um, you know, as, as you said, you know, if you if you're flying at a higher altitude than the GPS satellites, well, then you, you can't use your GPS uh, because you point they're, they're pointing in the wrong direction, you know, but, you know, so, so I would I would like you to just if you wouldn't mind just cover some of the considerations around power and then uh, also around communications. Yeah, that's great. Um, so obviously, and, if and before you questions... start, I'm sorry. Before you start, you yeah. only have nine minutes for both of those topics. Yeah, now I have eight. So, so, uh, so let's start with the power. So the first thing is that in the kit, if you go for the XK9 circuit, there is a double A battery um, uh, holder there that's called PBO4, and it it you can ask. And reports automatic in the software we made, but if you want to use the library for the PBO4, you can ask what the voltage level is and what the current consumption is. And then, of course, what you can do is that you can add the current consumption together. So we we uh, so 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 the way that you have to consider a, 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 a the budget here. So, so so let's talk about the restraint in the budget. So first of all, if you use the PBO4, um, then those batteries are not rechargeable. And the PBO4 itself is not a unit that is rechargeable. We have a, another unit that's called PLO2, which is a power LiPo CO2, which allow you to attach a solar panel. Uh, so you can get these uh, solar panels, uh, like the uh, cheap solar panels from uh, um, uh, this one here from Amazon. And then you can attach that to a PLO2, and then you can get yourself a, you know, a small LiPo battery, like uh, these kind of like small batteries here. This is like standard 3.7 volts uh, LiPo batteries. And then you can, you know, make yourself a rechargeable a circuit like that. Um, the one we provided is a normal PPM4, which is the AA batteries. And of course you can put rechargeable AA batteries in, but you have to, Take them out, recharge them, plug them back in again. It's not like uh, something that uh, is very useful in space. In space talk, you will call a battery that's not rechargeable. You call them primary. Yes, Judy is holding it up there. Um, so, uh, uh, so in in you call them primary batteries, and you call them secondary when they're rechargeable. And the reason for that is that uh, you're not allowed to have recharge charge the batteries only. Primary battery that's fully charged is fine. And if you use rechargeable battery, they have to be empty when you launch them into space and then first recharge. So some satellite guys, they will say, no, no, we wanna, we wanna make sure that once we uh, launch, uh, we have battery, maybe because they have to, you know, unfold the solar panel and then they need, uh, you know, power to do that. So they will have normal batteries to, uh, you know, do a burn wire. But this is actually a burn wire module. so. This OCR one, you can connect that to the PPO4, and then you can put a nichrome wire uh, in, in in one of the loops here, and it will take a lot of uh, the the current from the batteries, and it will actually be able to melt over a nichrome wire, or you can connect like a, a nylon wire to the nichrome wire and just burn it. Don't run it for too long, like 20 seconds or uh, three seconds is fine. Otherwise, you just drain the battery. Um, when you fly on 
uh, with the PPO4, but if you do a, a balloon flight like we talked about last time, then uh, I suggest that you get what's called a lithium battery. So not the standard uh, rechargeable lithium ion batteries, but just lithium batteries um, uh, energized and do a cell and all those have these uh, lithium batteries. They will, they're rated to minus 40 degrees and that Celsius, so you will have to sit with your calculator for some very metric. Um, and then, uh, but we've been flying with it to minus 52 in 12 kilometers high, so that I can calculate that, that's 36,000 feet. Um, so, so, so that's fine. So, so uh, for, for your purpose here, you, you have to kind of like consider a battery um, and, and power budget if you are, it, when, if you fly a satellite into space, for example, one of the reasons why you didn't use to do AI um, in um, in space was because this thing here, a computer power can take a lot of power. These ones here have reduced it dramatically, so you can do AI for for less power. Now the radio communication, uh, which was the other thing GDI asked me to cover, is going to be the the budget constraint because if you fly a satellite. And let's say 400 kilometers, that's like one of the most normal low Earth orbit, LEO orbit. And that's because you can launch from the International Space Station, or a lot of um, rockets is happily fly you to 400 kilometers. It's one of the, 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 the lowest altitudes that give you, uh, you know, like a, a, at least a year flight. Uh, when we flew the Sinsat, they flew from 207 kilometers. And because of that altitude, they were actually uh, burning up in the atmosphere already from that point. So they only flew for five days and then was out. But for the, the purpose and, and the, the price uh, that it cost to launch the synthet, and it did actually collect data for, for, for those five days, that was an okay project. Now, there's not a lot choices still when you want to fly, for example, um, 400 kilometers with the International Space Station, you can get a ride with the International Space Station, and when they have time, they will then launch it out of the Japanese uh, uh, window that, that they launch it from. But there's like a electron rockets, there's other uh, 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 type flights you can fly with. And they also have like a Ilana project where you can go in and apply for, for, for a flight. Now, what I think is that most of the people who is in this session here uh, it's not going to necessarily have a satellite that fly in space, uh, but have something where you want to simulate to flying in space. And that's the reason why we did the HK90, because if you only simulate that you're flying space, like for example, on a, high, on a balloon, then that flight will be, you know, you know, less than a day long, and therefore non-rechargeable battery will be fine for that. So let me jump for the last minute or two here over to the radio budget. So the radio stays on the XK90 are both 915 megahertz radios. So that's license-free um, radios you can use. And the whole thing is that you have something you call a link budget. So a link budget is that you have a transmitter that sends with so many, and, and we used to say milliwatts, but now we say dBm. So for example, uh, 100 milliwatt is 20 dBm. So you will, you will send a radio signal over 20 dBm. But the reason why we chose our radio is because the listener will listen with minus 148 dBm. So you have 20 send wheels and you have minus 148 you receive So you have a link budget of 168 dBm. And then there's like online uh, websites where you can go in and calculate your, your link budget. So you say, this is my frequency. This is what I listen with. This is what I'm transmitting with. Then you can go in and say, I have a, a monopole antenna, I have a dipole antenna, and that gives you 2 dBm or 10 dBm, and then you have a little bit of signal here and there, and then you can see what the distance is. We calculated if you have two balloons flying in 15,000 feet, they can communicate uh, across, uh, let's say, um, 700 miles or something like that. They have to be high up, so they're free of the Earth and the Fresnel zone there is of the Earth, but you'll be able to uh, communicate quite far like that. The orbit, you know, you're 400 kilometers over when you fly on a uh, on the International Space Station, so that's not necessarily a limit, but you have to make sure you have an orbit that flies over your head, obviously, and um, polar orbit flies over everybody's head, but 
um, if you take the International Space Station, um, then you should be covered in uh, most of the US, maybe not Alaska. Uh, but but that's the only kind of like uh, uh, problem. In both cases, they will fly over your position every 12 hours. Judy, I spent my time plus 20 seconds. Great. Bianca, thank you very much. What I've done is that I've asked everybody um, to, to give suggestions uh, in, in, the chat, uh, in the chat area. Um, what, what, I've, what I've done is um, uh, put that through. And uh, there are two speakers that I, I have lined up already um, in, in terms of topics. And what I'm going to be doing is that I'm going to be giving them uh, potential dates uh, for them to, to come back to us. Um, the, the first speaker is uh, John Hines. Um, he, uh, a, a number of, a few years ago, he, he retired from NASA Ames. And uh, he, was, he was really instrumental in bringing CubeSats into the research environment, uh, into the NASA Ames research environment and actually using them um, uh, very, very effectively. And so John has a lot of incredible experience to share. Um, I, had a, I had a call with him yesterday um, uh, asking him uh, if, if, he could, if he could present to us, to, to the group. And, and he actually mentioned that, um, that, you know, with a number of, of different authors, he's actually written a chapter in a book that's going to be coming out. And he's very, very happy to share that chapter with everybody. And that is all about how, how, do, you, how do you deploy uh, the CubeSat format uh, for your research project? How do you come up with your, your, your research topic, et cetera? So um, John is going to be sharing that with us. And also another thing is that he's really, he had a fabulous career. Um, and uh, so uh, what I've asked him to do is perhaps, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be looking at a number of questions to ask him uh, so that he can actually share with us um, his career path. Um, and so that what he can, so what we can do is we can actually use that video for, for students um, so that they can actually see uh, space technology as, as a really exciting and potential career. The second person that I've already lined up is a gentleman by the name of Mike Miller. And Mike is, he, he and his company, he's, he, he runs a, a small consulting firm. And what they do is that they get all of the paperwork ready for satellites to be launched into orbit. So there's a lot of red tape that needs to be gone through. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be submitted. And so what Mike will share with us is what is it that you need to consider? So this whole subject of the GPS, I promise you, is going to come up again with Mike. Um, but there are a number of considerations that you really need to take into account when designing your CubeSat so that you don't get rejected um, when you put through your application. So he comes with a lot of really, really great, uh, great tips. Um, and then I can see... I can see here in the channel that um, there's a question. Um, uh, uh, let me, uh, um, I need to open this up properly. Um, in terms of uh, metrics regarding wildfires and, and imaging uh, capabilities. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll certainly add that to the list. Um, and then also uh, in terms of, there's another question. Uh, around uh, data rates uh, that we can expect from satellites due, uh, using using different uh, radio transmission um, uh, uh, um, choices that we have, and what we'll do is we'll we'll probably um, we'll probably have uh, Dr. Edmondson uh, give us a, a session. On, uh, on, on radios, because that, that's one of his areas of speciality. The combination of radios, communications, and, and power, and, and how do you juggle those budgets? So um, let's, uh, let's, add, uh, let's add William Edmondson here to the mix. Um, and uh, great. Uh, I think 
I think that's that's it for now in terms of the the, the questions that we have, um, and also in terms of future topics. So. Um, our original plan was that we were going to have these sessions on uh, Tuesdays uh, as well as Thursdays. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that what we can do is in um, 48 hours time, we, we, can, have the, we can have the next session. Um, and the, the reason why I'd prefer to have two a week is because we've got a very limited uh, timeline in terms of the when the proposals need to be in so I'd really like to make sure that we can cover as many topics for you as possible um, before that before that deadline arrives so um, I'm not ex exactly sure which topic we will cover on Thursday but I will make sure that I send out the invitations the link um, and that I let you know as, as soon as possible regarding regarding the, the the topic for 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 thursday same time uh, on thursday so um i think i think that's it uh Bianca, um thank you very yeah, much i think cool uh absolutely and uh, so i'd like to say thank you to everybody um for attending the session um fingers crossed that the video worked this time and uh, let me have a look at the video later, and then uh, if it if it has worked properly, then then we can certainly send you all the link. So I think for now, it's uh, goodbye from me, and uh, thank you very much, and see you in forty seven hours. <laughs>